Now it's no accident that uh, Jerry Brown from NVIDIA is following the VR presentation because uh, here's a little secret that most people might know already. Um, the GPU, and NVIDIA makes most of them, uh, is the heart of all the technology that's uh, driving uh, all the progress that we're seeing in uh, VR and uh, just about any uh, VFX and, and displays. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without the acceleration of the GPU. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jerry. He's the Senior Manager, uh, Industry and Business Development, Media and Entertainment at NVIDIA. Take it away, Terry. I have the distinct pleasure of following all these brilliant uh, presentations today with absolutely zero content that you can actually sit down and use. So I'm going to talk about technology in a more general sense, but it was, it was great to follow the gentleman from Edge. Uh, just a second ago, who talked about VR, because a lot of what NVIDIA is doing is around VR. So uh, real quick, uh, we've been around since 93. You all know, probably, if you know NVIDIA, you know it for graphics cards, maybe GeForce gaming cards. But one of the real interesting things is what's been happening to NVIDIA lately. We've had a, a heck of a year, and um, we've actually uh, branched into several other markets that are just exploding. The biggest one is deep learning. It was real interesting to me to hear some of the comments today about, for example, from the gentleman from Lumberjack was talking about the scripting uh, tool where you can actually have uh, have a tool read it and, and read the literally interpret the, uh, uh, the video and the audio and translate it and transcode it for you and it is true that now AI systems for Microsoft are actually exceeding human ability the human ability to interpret language translate language computers are beating humans now they're at like 96 97 percent it's amazing those are all being powered by GPUs from NVIDIA so that's one of the things we're up to. If you, if you get in Google and do a search in the Google bar and it guesses the next word in your search title, it, that happens to everybody, right? That's a predictive feature of artificial intelligence. That also is being powered by NVIDIA GPUs. So there's, there's just an explosion of use cases for GPUs that are in compute and in graphics. And uh, it's, what's, what's most amazing to me is that if that wasn't happening right now, this would be dominating everyone's time in NVIDIA. This is a huge market also, but it's, but it's just one of a couple right now and VR is really changing everything about what we're doing with GPUs, what our design teams are doing and what we're predicting we're going to need to develop uh, to deliver to the market to folks like you in the next couple of years so that you can get your job done and you can use some of these incredible tools from Adobe and from Avid and so forth. So what I thought I would do is just give you a couple bullets on it and, and kind of get, get you thinking about it. Uh, here's one example of the kind of capacity you're going to need very soon as you start using these tools for VR even if you're not doing VR. You heard about uh, you know, folks that are using VR engines to do pre, um, you know, pre setup uh, shots that they're going to later on shoot live, right? Before you even build the set, let's check it out in VR. That's a that's an emerging uh, standard that you're going to see all over the place. We have we have studios that are doing mocap now using VR engines for animated movies. They're not doing VR; they're doing animated movies, but they're using the VR tools. Uh, and as they evolve, it becomes important to pay attention. So, just so you know, if you're using a computer game, 60 frames per second, 60 million pixels per second is kind of the benchmark. Uh, but what you need in VR with the goggles on is 450 megapixels per second. That's a big difference. That's 7x. So uh, you know, guess who gets to build GPUs that go seven times faster than last year's? That's, that's what our job is. It's a big job. We also have a huge issue with latency. There are some big things going on with your brain when you have these goggles on and you have lenses that are an inch or two away from your eyeball, but the content is saying that you're looking at a mile away in the scene that you're in the virtual scene that you're in. And then to make it even worse, if you move your head faster than we're able to change the imagery, your eyes are not agreeing with your head movement and you've got issues. And that's how you have, you know, what we call the vomitation effect. Um, and, and so here, here in instead of just sheer volume of pixels, you have latency issues. A fifth of a second, 20 milliseconds is what you need to be able to move, get pixels onto the screen that represent what your, you know, your change in view is. So there's some big drivers for us there. And, and, and on top of all that, what we have what we see is a display re uh, revolution. So we're all familiar with uh, the screens that you've been using for years for doing your digital editing. But now we've got spherical, spherical, uh, spherical uh, screens that are becoming more and more prevalent. Microsoft's doing all kinds of great things with holograms. Um, we've got uh, the goggles you see down on the left. You know, those are all unique types of screens that we need to be able to render to. And most of them are driving much higher resolutions. We've got HDR overlaid on top of all that, which you heard about this morning. So lots of challenges. So one of the things that um, we, we've most recently done to address both deep learning and some of the challenges that I just outlined with VR is, is we've, we've developed a new architecture. and We've just released it in the last few months. It's called Pascal. Pascal is our catchphrase for a lot of several innovations that we've integrated into the latest GPU. First is architecture. So I'll talk about that real briefly. The second one is FinFET, 
It's really just a die shrinks. We've, we've got a new manufacturing process that makes the ship smaller and run cooler and then faster. It's called FinFET because it looks like fins under a microscope. Our memory, we've gone from 7 gigahertz to 10. That's a pretty big jump. It's 40% roughly. Um, and in, order, in order to make those two things work, we've had to really tighten up the tolerances on our graphics cards so that, so that they can kind of keep up with this new performance. And then we've got all kinds of new technology. So, uh, so Pascal is doing all kinds of things. This one's a little bit archaic, but it's just it's one example. If you're a computer person, you know about programming, um, you know that we can do either compute or graphics. Uh, but in the past, we haven't been able to do them at the same time. We had context switching things we had to try to struggle with. So we made some big improvements so that we can now do dynamic balancing of compute and graphics at the same time. So if you're in VR, you have our graphics cards computing physics so that the movement is perfect. And so is the imagery. Uh, now we have some architectural modifications that are letting us much more efficiently use the GPU uh, than before. We also introduced something that's, I can't figure out how it works personally. I'm not an engineer. We call this simultaneous multi projection. We can actually draw in one pass up to 16 target screens. One of them could be a, a headset, one of them could be a lenticular display, one could be a curved display, one could be a dome. We can, we can do up to 16 at the same time that we draw the geometry from two different source points, which, which means stereo. So in the past, we had to do a separate pass for every single one of those target screens. But now in one compute cycle, we can do up to 16 from two different sources in one compute pass. So that's a huge architectural innovation that is present in Pascal. Okay, uh, Lens match shading, this is interesting too. We used to draw on the left, and then after we drew the entire left-hand screen, We'd say, oh, you want to you see that in stereo and goggles, let's cut it down and squeeze it to, to make it wrap around your eyeball, so to speak, in a concave look the way it's supposed to, supposed to appear inside the goggles so that it looks real to you in your eyes. But now we can actually process the right-hand screen and look at all the pixels we don't have to process now on the edges. We also can focus on the center. So the very center of the screen is full resolution, but the outer edges get less and less uh, high resolution. As your peripheral vision becomes more into play, you don't really see it out there. You just know it's there. So we've done things like this that are helping us make these things go faster. And my favorite one is to show last year, if you have a graphics card that was our Maxwell architecture, we do one pass for left eye, one pass for the right eye. But as I said before, now we can do both passes at once. We do left eye, right eye, and 16 different screens all at one time. So pretty cool things there. We also have a physics package when we're putting VR goggles on, or if you're using cinematic 360 immersive type of technologies, you need the touch features you might want to have work. So we're really, really putting a lot into our physics engines so that when you put on haptic gloves and, you, and you're simulating touching something, it works. That's a huge, um, huge investment on our part. Again, VR Touch is one of, the, one of the tools that's part of it. And here's my favorite. You heard a little bit earlier about audio. Audio is massive, and it's incredibly important for, for realism. One of the things that if you're in ray tracing, if you're a render person, you know about ray tracing where you trace light beams and they bounce. They call that global illumination, where you trace the light beam and it bounces at four or five different bounces. We've actually adapted that to audio. So believe it or not, we have directionally correct audio, high quality audio, but now we've adapted our optics ray tracing engine for sound. So you're gonna be able to have sound that is ambient sound that is accurate because you'll not only hear direct sound from my voice, but you'll hear it bounce off the walls and off the ceiling and all the other different objects with the textures modifying how that sound changes after it hits different surfaces and that's what makes ambient sound ambient, how it sounds realistic. So we're gonna, you're going to see that in our GPUs as well. Here's another interesting thing we just did. You can do capture from game engines or virtual reality engines now up to 8K images. So it's like taking a screenshot, except that it, it's up to 8K rather than what the actual screen resolution is. And we have filters. You can dump it into an EXR file and actually export it. So a lot of the gamers that like to take screenshots of a great moment in a game no longer is it going to be 72 DPI or whatever it is. It's going to be able to be a beautiful, edited, you know, fantastic shot from anywhere in the 360 space with a free camera. So that's another tool that we've integrated into uh, Pascal. And now, and now that's just been uh, put into the Unreal Engine. So you can actually use that starting now when, when games start to use it. And then lastly, we're introducing a 360 video stitching solution. That'll be out sometime next month. Uh, it's in beta, I think, next month and probably released in January. So uh, there's a few solutions out there. You heard about those, but we'll have our own pretty quick. So our SDKs, or software development kits, are really, um, really helping us uh, a lot. You heard a little bit about some of the great tools available from our partners. Here's just kind of a reiteration there. Adobe, a lot of the tools there are GPU accelerated, and a lot of the VR features from people like Metal. Uh, Add-ins like Skybox are letting you do some editing in VR in, P in Premiere Pro, for example. 
Um, and then very lastly, and I'm almost done, James, uh, what kind of cards have this new Pascal architecture in them? Uh, this isn't a product pitch, but just to let you know, we just introduced the P5000 Quadro. One of the things I would show you is notice the memory. This is our mid-range graphics card for the pro professional uh, segment now, 16 gigabytes. And that's because of what we just talked about. All this VR content, it's immersive 360, seven times the data. You're going to need more memory. So if anyone warns you in the past that, you know, you should have gotten 16 gigs instead of eight back in the day, and you didn't listen, and you got burned, this is probably what's going to happen now. <laughs> so my recommendation is the next time you do a tech refresh, buy as much video frame buffer as you can. Even our uh, top end card, um, by the way, we do support HDR in case you wondered. We also now support 5K displays. You can drive up to four of them off of one GPU, at 5K, one cable each. Uh, we also support HDR, as you would expect. And then our top end card called the P6000 we just introduced, that one has 24 gigabytes of frame buffer. So uh, again, we anticipate a large demand for frame buffer size uh, with, with all the things happening with VR and with some of these compute things that are happening. So uh, just a quick blast through. Um, big things happening in NVIDIA. And uh, lastly, we're reviving Mental Ray. We've completely rebuilt that. If you have any old content that was rendered on Mental Ray, old shots, you can actually pull those up with our new version, which will be available directly from NVIDIA now. And it's been completely revamped with GPU acceleration, which strangely enough, even though we owned it, it never had GPU acceleration, but now it does. So we've, we've uh, done ray trace acceleration, global illumination, and so forth. And just a quickie, adding a P6000 to a 14-core uh, system uh, gets you about a 12x speed up. So if you're doing ray tracing, a lot of rendering, that's, a, that's one hour instead of 12 hours. That's a big deal. And that is my shortened version. That's a fantastic presentation. Right. Thank you. Thank you.